Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so we've already had the little introduction, so I guess we can just plunge right into a conversation. Plunge away. <laughs> so you, you coming here fresh from Jaipur, and uh, among the many panels you were put on there, one of them was you did an onstage conversation with the Dalai Lama, about whom you've written a book previously. But I was curious, um, what was it like, to, I mean, it's one thing to have conversations with him, but what was it like to do that performance on the stage with that huge audience in Jaipur? Very, very easy. I think there may be somebody, some people here who are in Jaipur, and you'll remember I just said, Your Holiness, and then he spoke for the next hour. <laughs> so <laughs> it was not a very rigorous or onerous task. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the things that really tickled me about it, uh, and again, any of you who are in Jaipur will remember this, is that uh, His Holiness was given one hour, the same amount as Oprah Winfrey or Rahul Dravid or Amitabh Bachchan or all the great eminences. And at the end of the hour, he said, I'm ready to keep on going. 30 minutes, he was actually engaging in the audience and wanting to talk more and more. And they had to hustle him off stage because they had the next star coming on. Uh, and I think the only reason that happened was that the organizers never imagined that somebody of that eminence would be so generous and so eager to keep talking to the stage and I think to the audience. And I think anyone who spent any time with the Dalai Lama knows that his great gift is for demystifying himself. And people are often quite apprehensive before they meet him. He's a Nobel Prize winner. He's been leader of his people for 74 years. Uh, he's one of the most respected figures on the globe. But as soon as you meet him, He'll tickle you, or he'll pull your hair, or he'll do something, and you feel that you're meeting your greatest friend. So it what wasn't... did he do to you when he met you? Well, he bowed very deeply, <laughs> as if I was the eminence and he was the intrusive journalist. Uh, you know, and I was remembering, I, I met him the day after he won the Nobel Prize. I was driving around California near my parents' house. I turned on the radio and I heard, oh, the Dalai Lama's in California, he's just been awarded the Nobel Prize. So I drove down uh, to really intrude on him on the busiest day of his busy life. And the minute I got there, he grabbed me by the hand, he pulled me into a little room, and then he started looking around for a comfortable chair where I would be comfortable, as if, again, as if I were the new Nobel laureate and he was just the pestersome journalist. And then we sat down and he just looked at me and he said, I've won all this money, what should I do with it? <laughs> and he was, he was expecting an answer. You know, I was barely out of my 30s. I didn't know how to handle my own puny bank account. But I realized he was sincerely going to ask everybody that he met and was actually going to listen to their response. And then the other <clears throat> striking... And you didn't give a response? Not a, no, I was completely unprepared. I, I didn't say that. Oh, oh, oh. I spluttered because that's the last thing I imagined. And then the other interesting thing then was... Um, he, you know, so many Tibetans and people who care about Tibet thought, well, the Dalai Lama's won the Nobel Prize, our struggles are behind us, now finally we will get freedom. And the Dalai Lama, I think, is the most undeluded realist I know. So even the day of the Nobel Prize, he said, well, I really wonder if I've done enough. This, all I can do is take one step at a time. And he was the opposite of celebratory. And I was reminded of what a clear-eyed thinker he is. Um, so right now, when you think of the Dalai Lama, do you, does he ever strike you as a tragic figure? No, um, <clears throat> but there's a poignancy, of course, that Tibet has been lost on his watch. That's such a good question. Uh, I, I often think that of all the people I've met in my life, he has the single most difficult life. Living in exile for more than 50 years, responsible for six million people he can never see, up against the largest nation on earth. And yet, everybody in this room knows that if the Dalai Lama is famous for anything, <clears throat> it's his smile, it's his laugh, and it's his confidence. And I think in that way, it's very inspiring. Insofar as he's a tragic figure, he gives us hope. Because we have our own tiny hardships, and we look at him, and we realize, well, there's no need to, to, to give up hope or to be, be despairing if somebody in such a difficult situation has so much confidence. Right. But well, your new book, um, The Man in My Head, <clears throat> It was interesting because when I was reading that book and uh, I was thinking about your previous book about the Dalai Lama and it occurred to me that both are about this other man and uh, neither of them could be described as a biography in any sense. But are the books related in your head? 
Absolutely, to the point where they're indistinguishable, I would say. I think every writer's dirty secret is he writes the same book again and again and just changes the costume so that it looks to be different. Because I think all of us, whether we're writers or not, carry the same question through our lives as whether we're 30 years old or 60. And in some ways that never changes. We just come at it from different angles. So, so you're absolutely right. People will say, how can you possibly compare the Dalai Lama one of the men of most transparent goodness and warmth and selflessness with one of literature's most celebrated sinners, Graham Greene. But one thing that always strikes me about both of them is that I think they're, you could say, compassionate realists. Both really look at the world as it is and yet still try to find hope in it or still see that there's a capacity for making things better than they are. I'd say if there's one way of summarizing the Dalai Lama's philosophy, uh, it would be potential. He believes in possibility more than anything. And of course, that's the essence of Graham Greene. Uh, any of you who've read Graham Greene <clears throat> know that his archetypal character is a whiskey priest who uh, doesn't believe in God, has a mistress, gets drunk all the time, and yet in the minute of crisis, rises to a kind of compassion and selflessness that would put a cardinal to shame. And I think one of the other surprising things that they have in common is that Graham Greene always put kindness before belief. He said it doesn't matter whether you think there's a God in heaven or not. The most important thing is attending with compassion and selflessness to the people around you. The Dalai Lama's last book uh, was called Beyond Religion, mm -hmm. uh, in which he says it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Christian or anything, your first responsibility is in the, in the day to day to the people who depend on you. And, actually, and I should point out right here that the Dalai Lama, in fact, in Jaipur, told the crowd that the title Beyond Religion was not his choice. His publisher foisted it on him because they thought it would be kind of a snazzy and controversial title. So even the Dalai Lama has to listen to orders from publishers, apparently. Be careful, there may be a publisher in this room, but you're right. I mean, that was a lovely example of how he suddenly presents himself as on the same level as the rest of us struggling writers. Um, and the other thing I feel about Graham Greene is he was always very kind in his books to everybody unlike himself and very unsparing to the characters most similar to himself. But I see him as a deeply forgiving writer. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I was once on the bullet train traveling across Japan with the Dalai Lama. He comes to Japan every November for a week and throughout that whole week I travel right next to him as close as I am to Shondeep and I sit in on all his closed door meetings and it's a very good chance really to see him in all his different roles. And I had just run into a statement from Mao Zedong in which Mao said, if I say white is black, it's black. If I say up is down, it's, it's down. If I say right is wrong, it's wrong. And I said, isn't this a perfect example of dictatorship in action? No deference to the world as it is. And the Dalai Lama grabbed my arm and he said, never, never, never say anything against Mao Zedong. So he's saying that about the man who tried to obliterate Tibet, as we would see it, his greatest enemy in life. And he refused, even for me, to make a small criticism of Mao Zedong. And he said, you can always criticize the action because that's behind you, but never criticize the man, because the man is always capable of reforming or redeeming himself. And I was very shaken by that, that he would not allow anybody to criticize his greatest enemy. And that's exactly what I get from Graham Greene. Invariably, the person who is the protagonist's enemy suddenly out of nowhere saves the protagonist's life mm. and throws him into a moral conundrum by acting better than anybody would imagine. Uh, so in certain ways, I think both of them are addressing the same question, which is how do you lead a life of clarity and conscience in a very confused world? And that's a central question, at least for me. So they come at it just, I think Graham Greene comes at faith through the back door by showing the really fallen man who begins to rise. Mm. And the Dalai Lama comes through from the heights, but showing how every one of us has a Buddha nature or something possibly transformative inside us. And they're both, in different ways, homeless, are, you know, they're both traveling, yes. roaming, and you know, one might be by compulsion, one might be by choice, but the sense of, I mean, they're, they don't, they're not rooted in a, in a home in certain ways. Beautifully said. I had never thought of that, and I will steal it now and say it every time anyone asks me that question again. You're so right. And I think what that really means is neither of them will settle to a category. You know, one of the things I like about Graham Greene is he called himself a Catholic agnostic. He was an Englishman in permanent flight from England. He was a conservative radical. 
And the Dalai Lama too, I think, is always about dissolving all boundaries. So the most visible Buddhist in the world, he's called himself a defender of Islam. He seeks out counsel from Jewish rabbis about living in a homeless state. He's lived the majority of his life in a predominantly Hindu country. He gives talks on the Gospels. And I think that's his way of saying, I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist monk. I'm just a regular person facing the same challenges and possibilities as everybody else. But homelessness is a wonderful way of looking at both of them if you see home as a kind of contraction or um, right. a limitation of your responsibilities. And the other thing I was struck by reading both books was the way there have been certain intersections between both of them and your father. <laughs> An open road begins with your father as a younger man meeting the young Dalai Lama, um, newly exiled. And, uh, and of course, in this book, you talk about your father, including a very poignant thing when he reads your essay on Graham Greene. Do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, do you think that's coincidental? It if is. anything, it's a coincidence. <laughs> yes. And it also may have to do with my editor, who's always saying, please put your father in your books. So I have to squeeze him in whether he fits or not. But it's an interesting conjunction that I hadn't thought of before. And in the case of Graham Greene, it was a natural one. In the case of the Dalai Lama, uh, when, as soon as the Dalai Lama came into exile in India in 1959, my father, who was a philosopher, sailed all the way back from England, where we were living, in order to meet the Dalai Lama. And so I was lucky enough, really, to inherit a connection with His Holiness through my father. So there, it's just a circumstantial debt. But in the case of Graham Greene, what I was thinking about in, in this book that Shandeep is describing so thoughtfully and searchingly, was the way that everyone in this room has some connection with a singer or an artist or a writer where you somehow feel that this unmet stranger gets you, knows you and your secrets better than your own friends and family do. And so I decided to investigate Graham Greene. And of course, as you were saying, the more I thought about why do we create these alternative fathers or these shadow parents in our heads in opposition to the parents who really created us, the more I thought about Graham Greene, the more I had to think about my father. And then they did converge, and then as you say, I suddenly remembered the last conversation I ever had with my father was on the subject of Graham Greene before he died um, 17 years ago. And so um, suddenly, I think when, I, you know, when you're a little boy, women have this relationship with their mothers, men with their fathers. When you're growing up, you think in order to make yourself in the world, in order to define yourself, you have to run away from your family. You have to become the opposite to your parents. You have to define yourself by your first name, not your family name. And then 25 years later, you look in the mirror or you hear your voice on an answering machine and you realize you've turned into your parents. You rebel against them until you become them. And um, I think that's sort of archetypal pattern. And so when I was a boy, I was going back and forth between my parents' home in California and English boarding school, the archetypal venue or location of Graham Greene, and I saw them as opposite. And in the course of reading this book, I realized that I couldn't make hard and fast lines and that indeed they began to blur and merge and looking at Graham Greene was a way of looking at my father. And in terms of looking at your father, I mean, sometimes if you have a father figure who is, you know, very tyrannical or very angry, it, it's, it's almost hard, easier to have a certain relationship with him. Um, when you have a father who, who is actually hugely respected mm. by peers and mm. colleagues, um, I mean, I, the same thing with my father, people still come up to me and tell me like, oh, how much they admired my father. And then yeah. sometimes I wonder, I feel like I didn't talk enough to my father. You know, and, um, I, and it's, it's sometimes too tougher to have a relationship with goodness mm. than, um, and I was struck by that because there are several quotes you have in the book from uh, Graham Greene mm. talking about goodness and the, the problems of being good. And, um, you know, he says, uh, one of the characters says in the books, I wish you had a few bad motives you might understand a little more about human beings. And in another book, in the world, it's the good who do all the harm. Yes. Um, what, what was your relationship with goodness growing up? Were you the quintessential good boy? Um, well, let me begin by dodging that a little. <laughs> <laughs> by saying that Graham Greene's relation with goodness, I think, was that of somebody, 
a child, as it were, with his face pressed against the window, fascinated by integrity, purity, and simplicity that he could never get himself. And the poignancy of his books is he had such respect for goodness and felt himself to be so far from goodness. And that's the, the tension and, and the emotional heart of most of his work. In my case, I think I, I relate much more to what you were saying at the beginning of your question, question which is, I had one goal in life when I was a boy, and that was not to listen to my father. And then after he was gone, I realized, well, actually, the best source of wisdom in my life was probably my father, and I, through my pride, have squandered that opportunity. Uh, and also those mixed feelings that you implied uh, when somebody comes and says, Shondi, I got so much from your father. You wonder, well, what does that say about you, and how much did you fail to get from him, and what do you have to contribute? So something, I'd say, of all of that. And then I think we, we have a double standard. I think one aspect of this book came out of my sense, it's very, very difficult to look at yourself. And navel-gazing just usually throws <clears throat> up a blank wall. But as soon as you have some external thing that reflects you back to yourself, whether it's a place or a song or a person, with whom you feel an affinity, you can bring a much more penetrating gaze at those qualities you have in yourself. So that's what drew me towards Graham Greene. And also this sense of the double standard, whereby let's say you, you take out a young woman and uh, you say to her, you look just like your mother. That's probably the end of the relationship right there. <laughs> say to the same woman, oh, you look just like Virginia Woolf. And she's so wonderful, I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to say, to say that, even if in truth her mother is more beautiful, more compelling, more brilliant than Virginia Woolf. But we don't want to define ourselves often by our parents, and we attach ourselves to people who may indeed be more fallen than our parents are. And so maybe that's a little bit of mm. what's going on. I suppose in terms of goodness, I suppose this book to me is almost a dialogue between faith and skepticism. Because when I was growing up, my parents were living in 1960s California. Uh, the kids down the street were burning down the Bank of the America. The, all the foundations of society as we know it were being raised to the ground. Uh, the Grateful Dead was in the air. The smell of all kinds of curious substances was in the air. It was a whole new youth society coming into being. And I would get into the plane and fly for 10 hours over the North Pole and arrive literally in the 15th century in this English boarding school set up in 1441 where we had to wear full morning dress to class and sing hymns in Latin on Sunday night. And so I always became a bit of a hippie when I was in California and a bit of a skeptic when I went to England. Or being a canny little boy, mm. I saw how to play the exotic card and I would become a hippie when I got to England and a, a skeptic when I got to wide-eyed California because every little English boy in the 1960s or 70s seemed to me to have one goal in life and that was to be a Californian. So I pretended to be a Californian when it, when it helped me. But I think at some level, that is the question we all waver between. And, and Graham Greene really dramatizes that because all his characters refuse to believe but cannot accept unbelief. So they're always wavering between realism and romance, wondering how much to give their hearts and how much to stand on guard, when to trust and when to, to be their own masters. And I think that's a very, and that keeps issues of trust and faith alive as they would never be if you were reading Christopher Hitchens on the one side or Mother Teresa on the other. Right. Um, and that's why, in some ways, faith features much more prominently in his books than you would have on those who are very convinced of their positions. So w when did you become aware of the man in your head? Um, I suppose when I began to travel, and anyone who's traveled knows that when you're suddenly in a very alien country and the lights go out in your room and you're kneeling by your bed and you can't tell right from left or right from wrong, there's one companion you have, and that's Graham Greene. He caught that predicament, a very 20th century predicament, as eloquently as anybody, I think. And, well, I can give you some examples, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I began to feel, as I was stumbling around the world, almost as if I was just a figment of his imagination, or as if he was scripting my life. I remember once I was staying in this little town called Santiago de Cuba, and I was staying in a small hotel called the Casa Grande, and I walked out one morning to look around, and I got into a car, and the minute I got into a car, a stranger slipped into the front seat and promised to show me around, which is a bit disconcerting. It was more disconcerting when the stranger turned around and said, hello, my name is Faust. <laughs> it was most disconcerting when I went back to California, and a few years later I was reading a biography of Graham Greene, and I found that 35 years before I, he had been in this little town, Santiago de Cuba, he'd stayed in this tiny place, the Hotel Casa Grande, he'd woken up one day, gone out, got into a car to look around, and instantly a stranger had slipped into the front seat, promising to show him around. Uh, so it's clearly an abiding feature of that disquieting hotel. And I was so interested by this, I, I kept on reading, and a few pages later I found that Graham Greene was making confession to a priest called Father Pilkington. 
Of course, I remembered that the man responsible for my spiritual welfare all the time I was in my teens was my housemaster in school, a priest called Father Pilkington. They're not the same man. So I kept on reading in the biography, and I found in the 1970s, Graham Greene came up with this crazy idea of writing a whole play on a very obscure 19th century romantic painter called Benjamin Robert Hayden. And of course, I remembered at the end of the 1970s, flailing around in graduate school, I came up with this crazy idea of writing, yeah, you're smiling, you can see what's coming, of writing a doctoral dissertation on a very obscure 19th century romantic diarist and painter, Benjamin Robert Hayden. And these correspondences went on and on and on to the point where I flooded the pages of my book with them and my editor said, you know, enough already. These are interesting to you, but they're not to any reader. <laughs> and I took most of them out. But the correspondences in, its, in themselves don't speak for very much. Uh, but I think what really more unsettled me was I would read a page in Graham Greene or a sentence in Graham Greene and feel he knew my secrets better than my wife or my mother or my closest friends do. And as I was reading one of his books, I would know what one of the characters was saying nine pages later or would do three scenes later, and that was always correct. And all of us have had this relation with books because I think that's part of the magic of, 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 um, of reading, which is that you descend into a different mind for eight or ten hours, and if that mind has descended into itself deeply enough, you come to know his secrets and his terrors and his sins, as you will never, you hope, know those of your parents or your spouses or your, your siblings. And so you can form very intimate relations with writers and feel that they know you in uncanny ways. And so that's really the core of my experience with Green. But were you scared about, like once you realized you had this connection with, with somebody, were you scared as to where what abyss this relationship, what dark room it was leading you into. Yeah, thank you for the dark room, exactly <laughs> so. Because there are lots of other writers I have in my head I would much more happily associate myself with. I'm a great fan of Emerson and Thoreau and they speak for affirmation and radiance and possibility. I'd love if, it, if I were James Bond or Marcus Aurelius or one of mm. these great figures in command of the world. But you're right, Graham Greene is all about shadows and doubt and unsettledness. Exactly the kind of places you would rather not go but therefore exactly the places perhaps as a writer or a human you should go. And what I was inspired by and what I love about Graham Greene is he always looked pitilessly at the dark rooms, the dark corners in the world and the self that most of us would want to avert our eyes from. So in taking on this book, I was really taking on that challenge and saying, this is what I'd better do. It's easy for me to say I love Thoreau and I love the notion of human possibility. It's even easy for me to say how much I've learned from the Dalai Lama. But what can one learn from this self-professed sinner who is always talking about his own tormented mind? So it was scary, and the scariness was the reason to do it, I would say, because I feel one thing I get from Graham Greene is the most important thing is go right into your fears, uh, precisely the places that you would want to, to run away from. And it's interesting, you know, I, I was born in the same street next to which he had lived in Oxford, England. I was actually born in, now I think of it, the same hos hospital as his daughter. I went to the same elementary school as his son. I went through the same boarding schools of which he's poet laureate. I ended up in so many of the same places, Saigon and Havana and Port-au-Prince and South African Asuncion. And I could reel off a lot of correspondences in that way too that might suggest why I feel this kinship. But I wouldn't believe any of them because I think the nature and the power of kinship lies in its mystery. You walk into a room like this, and you look into the sixth row, and you see a stranger, and somehow you feel as if you know that stranger better than you know the friends and family you came with, and it's outside the realm of explanations, and that's why it has a power that anything explicable doesn't. So I was also interested in pursuing that mysteriousness, I suppose, and, and Graham Greene I think of as the great hymnist of the inexplicable. He was really bowing every day before what he could never begin to explain to his rational mind. That, that's a really beautiful way of putting it, instead of the inexplicable. Because um, I was struck by the jacket of... Do you have the book with you? Um, I've got, I've oh, got no, a few anyway, pages if you want. But I, <laughs> I was looking at the cover of the book, which, um, mm. you know, so there's this, the blurb from The New Yorker on top, which calls you, I think, like, as a guide to far-flung places, Pico Iyer can hardly be surpassed. And right below it is the title, which is The Man Within My Head. Mm. Where, and you know, the far from places and the man within my head, like the juxtaposition really struck me and it made me think, I wonder as somebody who has been known as a guide to far flung places, did any of that experience of going into those unknown countries, unknown places help 
in going into your head pursuing this sort of shadowy figure? No. <laughs> I think I've only gone to far-flung places because every place is a question. It's a way for thinking through something in your own life. So, for example, when I went to North Korea many years ago, I have nothing to say about North Korea. I don't speak the language. I've never studied the culture. But I was surrounded when I was growing up by a lot of people who lived in a kind of cult. And so North Korea was my way for thinking that through in an externalized form. And wherever I've been in the world, it really only has an internal application. Uh, after two weeks in any place, I have nothing useful to offer anyone except perhaps myself. Uh, and yet, I also, uh, I'm always aware of Thoreau, whom I was just citing, saying that the really important uh, are Antarctics and Amazons that we have to confront are the ones within. And that going to Ethiopia or Yemen is much easier than going into your relationship with yourself or with your father or with faith or any of those things. And it was good that none of my external travels really could begin to help me except as a launching pad. But I've always thought that, well, travel is most important as a way of talking about transport. And in the case of Graham Greene, about that internal travel, I, I'm not interested in the fact that he was always restlessly moving from Haiti to South Africa to Saigon, I am interested in the fact he was always trying to look around the corners of his assumptions, always trying to dream himself into the other. And that's the kind of imaginative movement or travel that seems to me really exciting, especially if you're a reader or a writer, that's what you're signing on for. Uh, so, as you, as you know, there are a lot of exotic places in this book, but I deliberately keep them in the backdrop. And I also try to keep them allegorical. Uh, for those of you who haven't read the book and never will read the book, if you're lucky, um, I, st I start the book in the city named for peace, La Paz, Bolivia, and I end the book near the city named for peace, La Paz, Bolivia. And that's not because I'm particularly interested in Bolivia, it's because I think most people's lives begin in peace and end in peace. I start the book with a near-birth experience, I end the book with a near-death experience, as a way of saying, my life isn't very interesting, but maybe there's something in this trajectory that speaks to anybody's life. We all go through some version of that journey from piece to piece. So I would say all the places in this book are allegorical. It's a sort of mm -hmm. pilgrim's progress, and that's how it was for, for Graham Greene. They were just... Foreign places are a way to confront the moral and emotional challenges that you can so easily sleepwalk past at home. Uh, I'm walking down the street in Calcutta and somebody comes up with a hand extended. What do I do? What is the right moral response to that? Very difficult, but it forces you to think about things in a way that I never do when I'm just driving to my, the, the local cinema in Santa Barbara. Oh, you call this book a counter-biography. And uh, I, was, I was wondering, how do you sell that to a publisher? I mean, don't they always want something that's all, that's like something else that's already out there. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who come, to, who pitch books saying, oh, this is going to be just like Pico Iyer in Kathmandu, but on a tricycle. <laughs> yeah. And so then you come and say like, oh, I'm going to do a, not a biography, nor a memoir, yes. but something called a counter biography. How did you explain yes. that? This is just like a biography, except there's no research, <laughs> nothing original and no work in it, yeah. Um, so, you're right, not, it was uh, not alluring. To, I, l I luckily have very indulgent editors who said this is totally mad, completely unsellable, but we'll take it on anyway. And they were probably relieved because the whole book began as fiction. And this is a small book, it's 240 pages, and I wrote 3,000 fully fact-checked, proofread, and copy-edited, polished pages, I would say, before sending 240 to um, my publisher, to my editor. And Half the book is fiction, half the book is non-fiction, and I was deliberately trying to blur the boundaries between them, so making it less and less commercial. Uh, but I suppose what I told the publishers, and I was trying to tell myself, is that books have to do something pretty zany to justify their existence now, because I'm aware that for everybody in this room, it's much more exciting to go on YouTube, to, to pick out your Blackberry now, and there are a million more scintillating things there than 240 pages of prose. So the only way that books can begin to compel somebody's attention is by trying to take you into those dark spaces in yourself that no multimedia instrument can reach. And that's partly why I was writing this very hybrid book. You know, wonderful 2,300 page biographies have been written about Graham Greene. Right. Uh, but I thought, do something murky that's not entirely fiction, not entirely non-fiction, and maybe for the handful of readers who pick it up, it will take them to some uncharted spaces in themselves. And I, I suppose I said some variation of that to, to my editors. And since 
my books only come out in very, very few copies, there's not a huge financial risk. And, you know, I'm a la I can therefore take chances in a way I couldn't if I were um, J.K. Rowling or John Grisham. So shall we hear a little bit from these 200-odd, 40-odd pages? Perhaps it would be a good thing to... Very odd pages, I would say. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'll read a little section. And I was just saying that because I grew up in England, the one thing we learned is you are not important to you and you are not interesting. And so I have a reflexive dislike of saying anything about myself. And my sense is everybody, everybody in this room at the center of her life has something akin to her house burning down. And the challenge of any life is what to do in the wake of that. So this is a little section that seems to have nothing to do with Graham Greene is really, I suppose, metaphorically about the houses that burned down in all our lives. <clears throat> there were fires raging all across the hills around our house, and I was sitting in a downtown restaurant with my mother and my wife, Hiroko. I'd flown into Santa Barbara two days before, and driving along the empty road that leads from the airport to our house ten minutes away, I'd looked up into the hills to where the lights of our home shine alone on our ridge, and my heart had stopped. There were two bright blazes of orange cutting through the darkness with a speed and efficiency I remembered from the time when our home in the same location had burnt down with me beside it some years before. I accelerated wildly up the hill and started taking the curves along the mountain road leading up to our solitary house at a crazy speed. The air to the north was already red and full of smoke, and as I pushed the car to go further, I could see sightseers along the side of the road gathering to watch the unearthly light show, great towers of orange, a hundred feet high, rising from the valleys just below our home, and smoke turning the sky into a sickly pall. I swerved, brakes screaming into our driveway, and summoned my wife and mother out to see what was happening a mile or two away. It looked to be remote still, but I remembered how, during the previous fire, the flames had raced through the brush at 70 miles an hour so that an orange gash in what looked to be a distant slope was suddenly a pillar of flames arcing over our living room windows. The next day, we awoke to the sound of helicopters whirring overhead. The sky was a grisly, blood-red color. The house felt hot already, and although the smoke seemed to clear as the wind shifted and returned us to a placid blue midsummer day, as the afternoon went on, the sky above the ridge next to us turned a hideous end-of-the-world color, or discolor, really, ash falling around us like snow. I went with Hiroko down to the post office, and as we came out after a short transaction, the whole suburb around us was black with coffee smoke. We looked up to the hills to where our house and our far off neighbors were, and all we could see were one, two, three slashes of orange angrily starting up across the slopes. We began to drive home, and switching on the radio, I heard that our house and the few up the road had been issued an evacuation warning. I turned into our little road and began driving up it, and the announcer on the local radio frantic said that the evacuation warning had been turned into an order. We had to leave now or we would be forced out. We drove the remaining five minutes at a crazy speed again, collected my mother, her dazed cat inside the little cage, gathered as many precious papers and photos as we could in five minutes, and then tore down the road again, fire trucks keeping past us in the opposite direction, plumes of smoke seeming to rise from all the valleys and the crevices in the hills, the air so thick we were choking already and driving out of what seemed to be an oven, the huge flames cresting above our house as if ready to engulf it. Now, barely 20 minutes away, downtown Santa Barbara was dreaming through another quiet blue sky afternoon, a miracle of calm. The angry smoke and orange burns to the north seemed to belong to another universe. We had to go about our life as usual. The next day would bring a fireworks display along the beach for July the 4th, and the day after that, I was due to perform a wedding ceremony for a college friend from England who was flying all the way over for the occasion. There's a story of the Buddha my mother began telling us now, perhaps to take our minds off the conflagration, and I listened to her, though usually all the wisdom that came from her, a teacher of comparative religions, I tried to block out because I was a son. When his closest disciple, Ananda, asked him what was the greatest miracle, she went on, walking on water or conjuring jewels out of thin air, changing the heat of one's body through meditation or sitting undisturbed in a cave for years and years, he said, simply touching the heart of another human being. 
acting kindly. That's the greatest miracle of all. Ah, the Church of Humanity, I said, like Graham Greene. I didn't care. I was citing the very writer my mother had liked when I was at school, and I had mocked. You remember, she said not unexpectedly who it was who told you to read Graham Greene. It was what he always believed in, I went on. The human predicament, the possibility for kindness and honesty, even in the midst of our confusions and our sins. He could never quite bring himself to believe in God. God was the other with whom he played his incessant games of he loves me, he loves me not. But in humanity, he had the strongest, if most reluctant, belief. In our fallenness lies our salvation. <laughs> the other two looked at me blankly, nonplussed by this explosion. But what I really could have been saying was that we were now in the world he'd made so real to me in his books, at the mercy of much larger forces, pushed back to essentials without a home. The only thing you could possibly do in such circumstances was see that so many others were in a similar predicament and reach out towards them. What you shared was not faith usually, but unsettledness. Up in the hills, meanwhile, the fires continued to blaze. And as I, as I read that, oh, thank you. <laughs> As I, as I read that, I see how apt your questions are, because there's the theme of homelessness, there's the Buddha making a cameo appearance. I mean, you really... And right before we came here, you know, we were t talking, and uh, Nirmalu from Penguin was telling us about the great fire that gutted the book fair and, right, and yes. burnt all the books down. Exactly. There is a fire in everybody's life, yeah. So, but, uh, the, so when you were young and you knew your mother liked Graham Greene, you... <laughs> Did you mock it because your mother liked it, or was Graham Greene just some, somebody you couldn't relate to at yeah, that time? Yeah, that was another of the questions you raised before. Well, he had two big strikes against him. One was that our teachers tried to foist him on us in school. He was an official text, so we really wanted to run in the opposite direction. And then over and above that, uh, my mother was a great fan, and so I thought, oh, anything my mother reads, I can't possibly read. Uh, and it was only, I suppose, in my mid-twenties when I started f finding myself in the forlorn corners of the world that, as I was saying before, I reached to, towards him as a companion. Uh, so now my mother and I are joined in our, in our love of Graham Greene. Um, and she doesn't act triumphant every time. She does, every time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's her prerogative, she's right. <laughs> but of course, that, I mean, that quintessential image of Graham Greene, as you described so beautifully in the book, as the lonely man in turbulent places. Um, and uh, you say that others have offered you a vision of that man as well in similar places. I mean, that's not an unusual character in fiction. But, uh, but no one had so persistently found him in every corner of the globe as Graham Greene. Do you see that Greene as a lonely man or a man alone? Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful question, and a man alone. I, I'm one of those people I love being alone, and I only feel myself when I'm alone. And so from the outside it might seem lonely, but I always regard it as a blessing rather than an affliction. I was an only child and I grew up 6,000 miles from the nearest relative, so I am completely delighted and at home as long as I'm alone. And that's probably one reason why I've sought out foreign places. Uh, it allows me to be unknown and unknowing. Uh, and uh, you're right, I think Graham Greene, well, he was always in flight from the familiar, from the worlds that he knew, and always wanting to place himself in that existential heath, as it were, the, the, the world of King Lear. So he certainly sought it out. And to go back to the earlier part of your question, for example, I love Somerset Maugham. And I recently brought out um, a whole edition of Somerset Maugham's travels as an excuse to spend many years reading his writing. And when I read Somerset Maugham, I see that same dance between skepticism and faith and that same understanding of the world and fascination with the, the back streets of human psychology. But he doesn't, I don't feel as if I'm seeing my own thoughts there. I feel as if I'm just watching a master at work. Whereas with Green, there's the much more intimate relationship. And I think one thing that's so fascinating to me about Green is that very archetypal thing. I never wanted to meet him because I thought if I met Graham Greene, I would see the very urbane, charming man, full of stories, who would know exactly how to keep me at a distance. But on the page, 
he somehow opens himself up nakedly, almost as in a confessional. Uh, he wrote two memoirs in his life, and the memoirs are full of charming anecdotes and colorful characters and childhood memories, and they're brilliant camouflages. You put them down having had a great read, and you really know nothing about Graham Greene. Yet in the novels, at least he gives the illusion of rendering himself naked. Uh, and I think intimacy is mostly what a, a writer wants in some ways, and he strikes that particularly English boarding school male intimacy that goes through me like a knife. So I think of him as an equivalent to the, the friends I have at school who are my friends for the rest of my life. You talked about going to unknown places. I was curious, when you go to an unknown place, what is the first thing you do? I would wager that for many of us out here, and you can put your hands up, when you go to an unknown place, is the first thing you do check the Wi-Fi and your internet connection? <laughs> How many of you do that? A few people, not, 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 I do, I mean, you know, and they like say, oh, is my Facebook accessible or not? But you, but do you feel, you don't feel a need to be connected in that sense, do you? Yes, yeah, so that actually chimes with your previous, maybe, the, you know, I'm somewhat notorious and not popular among my friends and editors because I've never used a cell phone, I'm not on uh, Facebook, I only just graduated from dial-up internet, I live in a two-room apartment in Japan without a printer or a TV I can understand or a car or a bicycle or anything, but partly that makes every day seem to last 100 hours and I, I don't feel fractured or accelerated or, or divided up the way I did, for example, when I was living in New York City. So, if I get to a foreign place, my usual impulse is just to walk and walk and walk. You're right, I have few messages to check, and by taking myself to a foreign place, I've ensured almost no messages. Uh, and I just try to surrender to that place and take in as many sights and sounds and smells in the first 36 hours as I can before my ideas and prejudices have begun to harden. And I find that when I go back home to write about a place, I will take back maybe 60 pages of notes. But really, the most burningly alive ones all come from those initial, on, initial hours. Um, and if I can't walk, I will get into a bus and take myself to the last stop on the line. And I, I like you, have two great advantages that make this possible. One being male. I think I wouldn't be able to do some of this if I were a woman. And two, having the complexion that we do that allows me to pass as a local in many places and just fade into the background. So if I'm in Indonesia or Syria or Cuba or so many places, nobody looks at me twice. And I can, I can go into the darker streets because I'm not conspicuously a, a tourist or a foreigner. And you do realize, as you wrote in that uh, wonderful essay in the New York Times, but the joy of quiet, that... that People pay good money, 2000, over $2,000 to live without internet and TV and all of that in California. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's always a business option that's waiting for you, <laughs> which you're already used to doing. But I wanted to open it up to a few questions in the few minutes that we have, because um, see if folks had inquired. I don't know what, um, is there someone with a mic or something, if anybody has questions? There is a mic here, which I can pass around. Looks like you may have to pass it to yourself. <laughs> but there's a question way back there. Um, here, I'll, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned you had to streamline uh, your original manuscript from 3,000 pages down to 240 pages. So, uh, how important is a writer's sense of discretion in situations like this, and how painstaking was that process? It was painstaking, but I, I, I chose to embark on that process because I, uh, I must say, when I first began writing 25 years ago, uh, I'm 100% Indian by ancestry, and so my impulse was to make my books like the streets of Bombay. In other words, throw in as many things as possible. And now, after living 25 years in Japan, I'm ever more interested in the Japanese aesthetic where you take everything out. And as many of you know, in a Japanese room, you walk in and there's a tatami mat and there's a single flower and there's nothing else in the room. And that means you're bringing all your attention to the flower and find everything you need in that flower. And so I worked really, really hard over, my, over the course of my years in Japan to try to include silence, empty space, uh, and, uh, and 
to charge the blank spaces in the page, to leave out as much as possible so that just their spectral image remains in what the reader reads, so that she may be stirred in some way she can't explain, but she's not actually getting data. Uh, so it was very difficult, but it was, uh, that was the excitement of the process, which is almost literally, I wrote, let's say, 200 passages, some short stories, some actual passages, and I laid them out on the, my desk, and I just took out as many as I could to see how I could make sparks fly between the few that remained. Uh, and I don't think I did it successfully, but I thought it was an interesting imp exercise to embark upon for somebody whose impulse is to try and squeeze as much as possible into um, a book. Uh, and, and saturate the reader. Uh, and I wanted more to tease the reader that she, so she would have to lean in and to some degree to write the book herself, which is a very Japanese way. You all know that a haiku has only 17 syllables, which means that each person who hears a haiku is essentially completing it and, and embellishing on it in her own mind. Uh, so uh, the beginning of your question was about discretion. And in some ways, I think Graham Greene is for me uh, a call to indiscretion. <laughs> and you know, my, my tendency is to try to say as little as possible about myself and the people in my life. But Graham Greene was calling me to try to be a little more candid than I would other, otherwise. So I would say the pages that I left out were the most superficial. Which, and I probably left out the discrete pages and tried to put in the ones that were as incriminating as possible in deference uh, to Graham Greene. And you know, it's crazy the kind of things writers do. But when I completed the book, uh, I had the title, The Man Within My Head, because Graham Greene's first novel was called The Man Within. And I had a subtitle, Graham Greene, Hauntedness, and the Parents We Never Know. And I, I, after I finished the book, I spent a year before sending it to my editor. And I just went about my life, and six months into that year, I suddenly thought, well, it's more mysterious and more intriguing if I just call it The Man Within My Head, an inquiry. And then another four months passed, and then I thought, let me take out even an inquiry. So it's just the man within my head. It could be fiction, it could be non-fiction. Who knows what this strange creature is? And so I spent essentially four months taking out two words, but I felt that the subtraction of those two words transformed the entire book, in my mind at least, and made it a different creature. And when I was beginning writing, I thought writing was all about putting words on the page. And the more I do it, I see it's about taking them off. But um, there and then there. If Graham Greene's entire catalogue was being destroyed, which is a terrible thought, but perhaps we should say burnt to pick up on your theme, which one work would you save and why? Uh, so it was the question: which one would I preserve? Yeah, which one would you preserve? Austerity. Um, yes. Yes. Well, easy for me. The Quiet American is my secular doubter's Bible. I've read it every six months for maybe the last 20 years. And one of the things I love about it, for those of you who don't know it, uh, it's set in Saigon in the early 50s. The main character is a middle-aged English journalist who loudly and repeatedly professes to have no opinions and no feelings. Into his life comes a young American straight out of Harvard, determined to reform the world in the light of the latest theories of Harvard Yard. And shimmering between them is this young Vietnamese woman, Fong. And so when first you read this book, and many of you may have seen the recent movie with Michael Caine, you realize it's a political allegory about the dance of empires, that Britain at the end of the Second World War realizes that its days of glory are over, it's being usurped by the great new power, America, and Britain mocks America because it envies it. And meanwhile, Asia kind of hovers between the two of them, and you feel will always remain outside their grasp and beyond their comprehension. But what so moves me about the book is even as it tells that very political allegory, it also tells this rending, intimate, private story about these three individuals who are all, as I was saying before, unsure of how and how much to believe. And Graham Greene was always known as a technical master, and one thing that he pulls off in this book is to tell this very public story and to thread it in with a deeply private story and to do all of that in fewer than 200 pages. And that's another reason why I tried to spent so long reducing this book to only 240 pages because I thought he was, if nothing else, the master of compression in economy. Uh, and I wanted uh, to try to refer and to defer to him by making it brief. But The Quiet American, uh, whenever people ask me what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan today, I can't really explain because I haven't been to those countries, but I would say, read The Quiet American. And this book written in Vietnam and about Vietnam 
57 years ago tells you exactly what we're seeing in the headlines every day. Who has the mic now? Um, Ma'am. Hi, hello. Hi. Thank you, Pico. Really interesting talk. Um, two, well, it's one question, but kind of two. Um, what was the most challenging part of writing this book, and what was the most enjoyable? It's all enjoyable, and the challenge is what's enjoy enjoyable, actually. Uh, I am a traveler at heart, but I travel mostly at my desk or in my work. And so each, with each book, I think of it as an adventure to a foreign country, and I try to make each one as different from the previous ones as possible, even though the poor reader is the victim. It's not fun necessarily for the reader to pick up a writer's experiment, but for me, it's fun because I feel I'm going somewhere I haven't gone before. And the most difficult thing was certainly writing about my father and writing about myself, because everything in me cries out. And I didn't write much about my father, but I had a bit about some fictional version. I tried to turn myself into a creature out of a Graham Greene novel. So I wrote only about those moments moments in my life where I would, I would feel myself to be a Graham Greene creation. But even that, which is veiled fiction of a kind, was very, very difficult and goes against the grain. And I was lucky to have an editor who kept pushing me and pushing me to go beyond surfaces and externals. But it was very, very hard. And uh, anyone who spent time in England knows how deep that resistance goes. Uh, I was doing a, an event with Colin Thubron a couple of years ago, and some of you may have read his great book about going to Tibet recently. And Colin Thubron, to me, is the exemplification of the best of the classical British tradition. So erudite, so self-effacing, so sympathetic and good-hearted. And, and part of the power of his non-fiction books is he keeps himself out. And in his most recent book, he just puts himself in glancingly and tells some stories about his family. But in the context of who he is, they're very explosive. And I was talking to him, as Shandeep is talking to me now, about what a bold thing it is even to have one sentence about yourself, given that he and I went to the same high school and that high school told us never, never put even the word I in a book. And it, it, it's a hard thing to do and therefore an interesting thing to do. Thank you. So we have time for one question. So, um, I think the mic's coming. If, if we could sneak a look into the notes you've made during the first 36 hours in Calcutta. What might we see as some jottings there? Yeah, Tim, you walked into this one. You said the first 36 hours are the ones where you make your formative impressions of a city. But well, it hasn't quite been 36 in Calcutta, but close enough. No, and a lot of my walking has taken place in the beautiful ITC Sona, which I'm not sure is representative of the whole of Calcutta. Um, but thanks to my host here, um, I, I, I was interested that the first two places that I asked many of my friends who know Calcutta where I should see and two of the answers that came up again and again were the, the, sem the Park Street Cemetery and St. John's Church uh, and they were very powerful places for me. I've never seen a cemetery like that and for somebody who was born and grew up entirely in England and is of Indian ancestry. It was as if seeing you know, both parts of my life coming into very potent collision there. I haven't had as much a chance to walk around Calcutta as I would like, and I would never presume or dare to write anything about Calcutta, especially when there's so many brilliant Calcuttans who've shared your city with the rest of the world. Uh, but just going to those places, uh, I would love to spend many more hours following that particular thread of inquiry as far as it would take me. Um, and I was surprised when I went to the cemetery to see it was only English people there. And these, I was telling some friends last night, these lines of 18th century poetry, that when you encounter them on the page, look rather flat, things from Pope or Dr. Johnson or whoever. When you see them on a tombstone and you feel all the feelings that have been pressed into the memories of those people who many of whom died aged four, died 11 months or died 23, suddenly these lines of forgettable poetry acquire a majesty and a pathos that I would never find in them outside that cemetery. Uh, and in the context of the British experience in Calcutta and in the context of everything around them, that cemetery alone, I think, would, uh, would keep me going for a long time. Well, we would keep Pico here for a long time, but we have to make way for the next session. So please join me in thanking Pico Ayer for spending this hour with us. Uh, and I would just like to thank Sh Shondeep every now and then, quite often actually, I'm asked to interview somebody and that's a very difficult chair to be sitting in, so thank you for doing it so seamlessly.